Amen. Thank you very much, Jeff. Good evening to everyone. Welcome again to our study session. Just to pick up um, a little on Jeff's opening remarks, but there was a little calling program today. And it was an individual who called in. He, he did not identify you know, his um, particular denominational connection. But he was addressing the same issue with the Good Friday and putting forward the argument that Jesus was crucified on the Wednesday. Interestingly, I rose on the, the Saturday evening at the, at the Sabbath was about to end. And, and he said, interestingly, that's what we were spending a lot of time um, discussing. Mr. Blackman, really the fact that he, that this same person had calling a number of times before expressing the same um, sort of sentiment. And Mr. Blackman, the host, went on to say, Despite all his technicalities and all the information he's given, and the very explain it's not a technicality, it's just basically what the Bible shows, what, what is in the scripture. Then Mr. Blackman went on to say, Well, listen, I know how these Christians are here. But you could show them all these technicalities and all this information that you believe is the truth and, and your particular position as you see it in the Bible. He says, he went on to say, these Christians will continue to celebrate Good Friday as the death and Easter as the resurrection and they will still celebrate Christmas on the 25th of December. What he was basically saying is as much enlightenment as you could give, and he was saying these Christians, I know how these Christians are praying. That was the sad comment because he didn't, he didn't come directly out and say, he was insinuating that Christians are people when they hold on to a particular traditional stance, despite the evidence that is coming to maybe clarify a position or, or to be explicit on a position, they ain't going to move. So the majority of the Christians believe that and they will continue to operate that way. Now, I think that that's, that's sad in, in that we are viewed as, as people who, who would rather maintain a traditional position because it has been the established position in the light of evidence and truth um, which might come forth. And what the guy was basically arguing, I am not bringing this up on, on technicalities. I'm just showing what is the information that is revealed in the word. And that's all I'm trying to do. So I, I want to make it clear here that the event is the important thing. And, and sometimes we pay too much attention to the timelines and the details. And basically, we need to focus on the event because that's what is important. I agree that the resurrection is important. And the crucifixion is important. I explained that already. These are paramount to the foundation of, 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 of the Christian faith. They, they're the bloodline. And a lot of what we believe and teach depend on these. And, and therefore, there are things that we must seek to establish, and not only seasonal, but these are things that we, we must get in the psyche of people and, and get imprinted on the minds of, of people. And that's what I'm saying, that we should not be even controlled to the extent by traditions that we only focus on the crucifixion or the resurrection at a certain time of the year. And, and for the most of the year, then we don't focus on, on the events and keep repeating them, keep saying about them, preaching about them, seeing that they're so fundamental and that they're so important. So I am not saying that we, we, we emphasize the timelines and the details at the expense of the actual event. What I'm saying is that both of them are connected because the resurrection, the crucifixion, they are historical events. They are things that happen in history. And things and history is time. History is connected to time. And the times are identified by God Himself. And that makes the, the timeline very significant. So what I'm saying is that you cannot ignore the timeline. But you recognize that the event is the important thing. Christ's death and resurrection is what is critical, not just to Christianity, to man's salvation and his relationship. God and, and, and the defeat of the adversary and, and the authority that Christ has in the world. Fundamental and, and, and they are of significant value. But what I'm saying is these events took place in time. And, and, and what I'm saying is that there have been misrepresentations, there they, they, they have been contradictions, and there are 
been a lot of things that people see as discrepancies associated with the timeline. And this is what I'm trying to clarify because we have to focus on the truth of the Bible. Christianity is on the attack, and I said that already. People are not attacking on these corner programs, Hinduism, Buddhism, and, and, and a lot of other religions because Christianity fundamentally represents the truth. We believe that this is the truth and we need to proclaim the truth. And to proclaim the truth, we have to be able to defend the truth and eliminate what appears to be contradictions or discrepancies because that's fundamentally what is different between Christianity and all the other religions. We proclaim that we have the truth and that the Bible is the revealed word of God, which gives that truth. And therefore, we must be clear that when we speak on the Bible, we speak with authority. And anytime that people can come up with things that, that would want to, to um, discredit the Bible, its authenticity and its reliability, we have to defend those things because that's the only way we can stand by the truth. And it's important because if we, we shift the truth to maintain a tradition and ignore the reality, then what I'm saying is that other people who have particular views to express will also hold on to those views and, sh and shift accommodate their position and then throw it back at us and say that you have neglected the truth to hold on to a traditional belief. So why can I throw away that, what you, so, what you say is the truth, and hold on to my view when it comes to another position that I have, that I, I want to believe is right. And I, I keep mentioning often homosexuality, but the other things in relation to people's view about creation and versus evolution. So we have to be able to, to hold the Bible up as reliable, as authentic, and that does not have any contradictions or discrepancies, because that's the only way we can be able um, to maintain the strength of what we believe and the conviction that it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the only way to God, because it is the truth established by God, and we need to defend it. So I, I just want to get that clarified. So, so yes, I'm strong about the resurrection, I'm strong about the resurrection as events. But I'm saying that we need to focus on the details and the timelines, because there are timelines that have been established by God, set in place, and the narratives that are given, sometimes because they're given from a different perspective, sometimes show things that are different or relate details that appear to be different, and people question then the authenticity and the reliability of the Bible. I was, I was reading um, a, a blog from a person who, who is a criminal investigator. He was, he was examining the accounts given in the New Testament, in the Gospels, in relation to the same events, the, the crucifixion and the resurrection. And yes, he was looking at the differences which occur in the narratives between the, the four Gospel writers. And he was saying, as I said earlier, this is, this is not a problem or a weakness, this is a strength. And he says that whenever he would send out um, his investigators to, to gain evidence um, in relation to criminal activity, he would say to them, make sure you get independent sources. Make sure that your eyewitnesses do not collude or, 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 or do not um, get together to share the information. I want the independent um, reports. They might be different, but at the end of the day, that's the best way we can get to the truth. Because he says his position now as, 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 a, as a criminal investigator is to take these details, look at all of them that are given, because people give them from different perspectives and different backgrounds, different positions, and different uh, times when they might have witnessed certain things. And he said that the investigator brings all of these details together to get to the truth. That's what we're trying to do. Look at Luke, Matthew, Mark, John, see how they relate the narrative in relation to the crucifixion and the resurrection, get the details together and bring one story. And we will realize when we examine them, they say keep, pay, keep paying careful attention to the timing of it, the different perspective and what different um, writer might focus on and the details that are given. And we will realize that even though they seem to be different, they still harmonize and speak one truth. That's what we're trying to get at. And don't let our minds be conditioned by the tradition that has been established at the expense of seeing the truth as revealed, revealed in the details. That's where we study. That's where we examine the word of God. 
that we can get to the specifics, to the details, and see how they harmonize. And that's what we have been doing all the while as we have examined the, the narratives in relation to the crucifixion and the resurrection. And I, I hope that as we examine them together, that we are open to, to seeing the truth revealed and not be closed-minded because we have been accustomed to a particular traditional viewpoint. Because it could be traditional, but wrong. It could be accepted by a majority, but still wrong. At the end of the day, the Bible stands for the truth. And once we can get to that truth, that is what we point out. That is what we teach. That is what we highlight. And as I say, it's not to, to pull young people's traditions and, and practices in, in, in that way. But it's to examine the truth to let people know what the truth is. And then they deal with what the Bible the perspective is and not what the tradition indicates. All right, tonight I said we will want to look at the specific details in relation to the persons on the cross because this is one of the other apparent contradictions or what might have been established as a traditional view that there were only two persons on the cross, Jesus. We're going to examine the scriptures in detail, all four accounts just relating to that particular aspect. We're going to examine them because I, I am putting forward that there is an indication from the accounts, if we study them carefully, that there could be more than two persons on the cross with Jesus. We look at them together. I share my perspective on it from how you look at the details. You would agree if it seems plausible and it seems um, reliable from the accounts that we have, that it could be what the Bible is actually indicating rather than what the tradition might have established. Because we, we have to be careful of what traditions establish, because sometimes traditions are based on what the view might have been at that point in time, it gets established. People go with it, and, and the tradition becomes accepted as if it is, it is the truth. Uh, people defend it as the truth. And then when you come to read the world with a preconceived notion that it is the truth, you can miss um, represent what is the actual um, narrative indicated in the word of God. So let's pick up from Matthew. We're going to read each of them, just that specific um, part related to persons on the cross. We have looked at a number of other discrepancies or apparent discrepancies and contradictions, and we have been able, I believe, to reconcile them. There might have been a few more minor ones. We can look at all the details, but those were the major ones that we, we examined, and we are going to look at another one tonight, and then we will move on to look at the narratives in connection with the resurrection. We will not be able, I believe, to complete all the um, criticisms that are leveled against those accounts as well, which means that we're going to have to pick that up in the following session. And then I want to close off in the final session with looking at the spiritual application of the resurrection and the crucifixion. Because if we, if we just focus on celebrating the event, I miss the real spiritual implication of the death and resurrection of Jesus as it applies to us, I think we would miss something very, very significant. If you would have listened to um, Pastor Weeks' sermon on Sunday, he, he spoke very well on, on that, what, what the resurrection, the death, and the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus means to me as a person. How the Bible sees it spiritually, what application can be made. It's a very good sermon, and if you to see it, you, you get a chance to watch it because it will give you some then insight as to what I will be dealing with in that in that final session. We will look at us being dead, us being resurrected as in, as individuals, how it applies to us. That that will be, be our final session. So we pick up from Matthew, the book of Matthew, and I'm going to be reading Matthew chapter 27. And I'm going to be reading from verse 33. Remember, you're just focusing in. On, on the events connected to Jesus' crucifixion and those who were on the cross. And then we're going to analyze details. 
So I'm going to read the accounts from all four, and then we're going to discuss the details together. And I'm going to show you perhaps that there could be a different perspective that, that many people may have missed. And we, we have followed the tradition of just two people on the cross with Jesus. All right, Matthew 27 from Teresa. And when they were come into a, onto a place called Golgotha, that is to say, a place of a skull, they gave him vinegar to drink mingled with gall. When he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots, and it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vestures they did cast lots. And that's actually Psalm 22, 18. If you read that, you will see that it is speaking precisely of that um, section there. Watch this carefully. Verse 36 says, and sitting down, they watch him there. These are the persons who crucified Jesus. They sat down and set over his head his accusation written, this is Jesus, the king of the Jews. Then were two thieves crucified with him, one on the right hand, another on the left. And they part and they pass, and they that passed by revile him. And I am not going to go into all the details of what they said. Let's skip that you know, for time purposes. But you'll see the comments that they made about Jesus. But verse 44 went on to say, the thieves also which were crucified with him cast the same in his teeth. All right, so note carefully here is that they said that these two thieves, other translations said robbers, same thing, were crucified and it indicated that they, the, the soldiers rested a while after they parted his garments and cast their lots. And then they went on to say, then they were two thieves crucified. I am arguing that the thieves that were crucified were the last set of persons that were crucified. Because if there were other persons said to be crucified after the, the, the thieves, you know, you would want to ask the question, why would the, the soldiers would have rested? They have to get these persons on the cross. They have to die. They have to get them done before the Sabbath. And if they're going to take time to rest after the crucifixion and, and, and cast lots and, and argue for his garments and who will get what. I am saying that the, the, the two thieves, or the robbers, were crucified after the other two persons. Now, let's see what uh, Mark says. Because Mark agrees um, with Matthew. We're going to read Mark, then we're going to read Luke. I'm going to read Mark chapter 15. I'm reading from verse 22. And they bring him onto a place called Golgotha, which is being interpreted the place of a skull. And they gave him to drink wine mingled with myrrh. Matthew said gall, but it's bitter. So, you know, we got the idea, but he received it not. They agree on that. And when they had crucified him, again, they parted his garments, cast in lots upon them, what every man should take. And it was the third hour, and they crucified him. Explain already that that third hour is Jewish time. That would say about 9 a.m. 9 a.m. And the, the superscription of his accusation was written over him, the king of the Jews. And with him, they crucified two thieves, one on the right hand and the other on the left. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says he was numbered with the transgressors. Now that one is Isaiah 53, 12. He was numbered with the, the transgressors. And, and again, it's mentioned here, he was crucified with two thieves, one on the right hand and the other on the left. That's Matthew, that's Mark. Let's look at Luke 23. We're going to read from verse 39. And one of the malefactors, notice the, notice the word that Luke uses. He did not use the word teeth or rubber. They said some translations use teeth and some translations use rubber. 
Matthew's translation, I'm sorry, Luke is saying, and one of the malefactors. Now, this is a different word. And I want to let you know here clearly that there were two words used in the original Greek version. There was the word lestes, which is spelled L-E-S-T-E-S, -E which means a robber. And there was another Greek word which used, which is kakorgos, spelled K-A-K-O-U-R-G-O-S. Two different words are used in the original Greek. One is translated robber, the other is translated malfactor in Luke, which is kakorgos. Kakorgos, K A K O R G O S. So Matthew and Luke would be saying there were two lestes that were crucified with him, or two robbers. Luke is saying that there were malfactors that were crucified with him. And, and some versions use the word criminal rather than malfactor. The King James Version uses the word malfactor. Now you would argue, yes, some would say criminal, but a robber or a thief is a criminal. So there's no real big deal here. But what you need to understand is that yes, robbers are criminals, but not all criminals will be robbers. Because Jesus was committed, was being um, crucified for a crime, but it was not robbery. He was being crucified for the crime of speaking against Rome and saying that he was the king of the Jews. Therefore, Caesar was not king. That's what the Jews were saying. We have no king but Caesar. Jesus is saying he's the king of the Jews. That's the implication here. So, yes, so for them, that's a crime because you are speaking against Rome. That's a serious, serious um, criminal activity. So, yes, you can be accused of a crime. Murder is a crime. A robbery and or, or, or being a thief is a crime, but not all criminals will be robbers. So, what, what Luke is doing is using the other word that was used. So the argument here is that the four accounts are really accurate, but they're speaking about two groups of persons that were on the cross with Jesus. Mark, sorry, yes, Matthew and Mark are speaking of the lesties, the Greek word which it um, translated as which is translated as robber. Luke is using the other one, and he's speaking out of the other group. So we read what he says, Luke 23, 39. And one of the malefactors, one of them, which were hanged, railed on him, saying, If thou be the Christ, save thyself and us. Now we just remember that we read Matthew and Luke, which says that both of the thieves, not Matthew, sorry, Matthew and Mark, both of the thieves were the ones that joined with the crowd and mocked Jesus, basically calling him an imposter. So they, both of them, were railing on Jesus, right? And, and, and this is going to identify the fact that we're speaking about two groups of persons. And I tell you how people try to get that reconciled. Luke is saying only one of these malefactors rail on Jesus, saying, "If they'll be the price, save thyself and us." But the other, the other, answering him, rebuke him, saying, "Thou dost." Dost thou not fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Now, watch what this other criminal is doing. He is rebuking the one of the malefactors who is joining with the others and ridiculing Jesus and saying, you know, you say you are the Christ. And why don't you save yourself and save us? And watch, watch carefully what the other person is saying. Don't you fear God? And he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. You watch how profound that is coming from a, a person who is a criminal. He has shown an indication that he has respect and reverence for God. And he is telling Jesus to remember him when he comes in his kingdom. What, what, what is he speaking about? 
this this person have to have some detail and understanding of what Jesus represented, who Jesus is. He's speaking of him coming in his kingdom and asking him to remember him. Very, very significant. Now, what, what some um, theologians have indicated is that, yes, both of the thieves would have been ridiculing Jesus and mocking him and calling basically a fraud. But, but, but one of them repented and asked Jesus, to remember him. I want you to think this very too very carefully. If you could be one of those two thieves that are saying those things about Jesus and mocking him and laughing at him, and then a, 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 a few hours afterwards, you're going to come and make these profound statements. You will wonder why in the first place you will be mocking him and calling him a fraud. And then to come and ask the other person, oh, if you don't fear God, and, and, and asking Jesus to remember him when he comes in his kingdom. I'm saying with, with what he's indicating at the knowledge and understanding of Christ, chances are he will not have any same person that would be joining with the crowd previously to mock him and call him a fraud. And then a few hours after to come and make this profound um, sort of comment. So, so work with me through that. That's what I'm thinking to this. So I'm inclined to agree with some of the other um, commentators, Bible commentators, though you don't see a lot of them, um, usually in the, in, in the group of, of persons who move against the tradition. Usually you find a very small group of persons that go against your tradition, but they want you to understand that there are people who look at the original views and come up with different positions on them, but they're very often in the minority. And that's why I say to you often that it might not necessarily mean that the minority could be wrong. The minority could be very, very right looking at these arguments here. So far, this is what we have. Thieves were crucified and malefactors translated as criminals in some other versions, but in the King James Version, the word malefactor is used, were also crucified. Now you will notice that all three of the gospel were mentioned born on either side. But if Mark and Matthew are referring to the robbers, they are right. And if Luke is referring to the, the criminals or the malefactors, he would also be right. Because you could have two robbers, one on either side, and two other criminals or malefactors, also one on the other side. So when each person says there was one on the other side, if we do not recognize that they are speaking of two different groups, and as they say, there are two Greek words that are used, and the Greeks are very, very specific when they come to identifying things that they mentioned before. That's why you get different words in the Greek for love, even though we might just use the word love in English translation. The Greek has different words. They are very specific of words and meanings so that you are very clear and, and they are very precise on, on what they want to represent. And, and that's perhaps why you have two different words, one being translated as, as a thief, and one being translated as a malefactor or a criminal. So Matthew would have been right when he says there was one on either side because there was one rubber on one side and the other rubber on the other side. Luke says there were two on either side, and one said to the other person, wait, are you doing this and joining with others? Don't you understand what position you are in? And he really ask Jesus to remember him. So technically we are saying that all the accounts could be right and yet there could be four persons and not two. Because one group focuses on the robbers, the other group focuses on the other two criminals and each of them were on either side. So in other words, on one side of Jesus, you would have had a robber and the criminal. On the other side, you would have had a robber and the criminal. The two criminals were led away with Jesus and they were crucified with Jesus first. So they were on the cross closest to Jesus. They were on the inside. The robbers then were crucified later. And that's why after the robbers were crucified, the, the, um, the, the soldiers could have sat down, had time to rest and watch Jesus on the cross and arguing about his garments and parting them and casting lots and whatnot. 
I am saying if they were if they were create create crucified first, then they would not have been basically using all that time, wasting that time, arguing about who would get the, the, the garments and whatnot, and still have two other teams to put up on the cross. So the, the argument basically is that the two criminals were on the inside and the two others, the great Charlie Roberts, crucified second were on the, on the side. Let's see what John says in the final one. John 19, 17 and 18. And he bearing his cross, went forth onto the place of a skull, which is called a hero or Gotha. See, they're, they're agreeing on that. Where they crucified him and two others with him on either side, one, and Jesus in the midst. All right. Now, who is he focusing here on now? Now, remember, I indicated before that John is the last of the writers of the, the Gospels. Matthew and Mark are the first two, followed by Luke. And then John is the last one. Now, Joe, notice that, that John does not mention whether they were, they were um, robbers or criminals, but John is summarizing the event. And he is, is making sure that he is very clear on the specifics that if you might be inclined to misunderstand what would have gone before in Matthew, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, that you are clear with his summary of what has happened. He bearing his cross went forth onto the place of the skull, which in the Hebrew is called Golgotha, where they crucified him and two others with him. On either side one, and Jesus in the midst. Now, if you just read this as is here in the text, you'd be inclined to say, but Pastor Chapman, what is the issue here? Everybody is saying that there's just one on either side. Now, whenever you are in any doubt or you need to get further clarification, remember we said that this is um, important in, in, in your biblical hermeneutics. If you can go back to the original, it's very, very important getting to the truth and understanding what the writers are saying. Where you can do that, it sometimes become necessary. What you have here is a translator's version. It is not the original Greek version. The comma after him is added by the translators and the word on either side, one, is added by the translators. That is not in the original Greek. And what has happened here is the translators have, have also been caught up in the tradition of, of the view that there were only two persons on the cross with Jesus. So any indication that seems to be different from that, they are, they are going to say they're going to try to clarify it. And that's why they put in the word one, because they are going with what Matthew, Mark, and Luke seem to have been indicating according to their understanding that there were only two not realizing that we're speaking of two different groups of persons, two on either side. And what the original text that, that John here is quoting, and which has been translated, what John is saying in the original. Let me read what the original was saying. The Greek word, slightly differs from the English order so that we will literally translate the text as and with him two others on this side and on that side that's how the literal translation would have read and with him two others on this side and on that side but Jesus in the middle the Greek phrase and I'm not going to spell it out for you to confuse you but the Greek phrase that is used here in John is the same Greek phrase that is used in Revelation chapter 22, verse 2, and is translated on either side. And it was speaking of the tree of life, which was on either side of the river of life. And that same phrase here that is used in John, translated on either side in Revelation 22, 2, should have also been translated on either side 
in this version here. But the, the, the original um, literal translation was said, and with him, two others on this side and on that side, but Jesus in the middle. It is also important to note that in the original script, the word duo, the Greek word D-U-O, from which we get the English word dual or double, right, comes directly before the phrase that is translated on either side. So what should have been the correct translation is that there they crucified him with two others, because that's the Greek word that comes before the phrase on either side, two others on either side and Jesus between them. So that's what John is saying. And what John is doing, remember in the original, is, is very friendly fact, in case it is misunderstood from the account given in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, to read just two persons, one on either side, and not realizing that Matthew and Mark were speaking of two different persons than those Luke was speaking of, and John now ensures that that is clarified. But what I'm saying to you here is that the original Greek translation was changed slightly by the translators because they were trying to make it agree with what their original understanding and interpretation would have been in that there were only two persons being spoken of, one on either side. John is making it here clear in his comment, and as, is, as I said before, John does that very often to make sure that we, we get the truth and we get the correct understanding that is intended because he would have read the other Gospels and he, being the last one, would have tried to make sure the truth comes out. And, and, and the original Greek translation should have read According to John, this is what John is saying. This is not what people are making up. This is what the original version says. They, they crucified him with two others on either side and Jesus between them. Now, there's another point we want to look at before I open up for you to make any comments or question anything. John 19, verse 32 and 33. John 19, verse 32 and 33. I have it here on, in the ESV version. You may have it bring up in the, um, in the King James version. It says here, so the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Now, when you, when you examine things very, very closely, it reveals things to you that you very often miss when you're casual reading. All right, now let me read it from the King James versions so that you don't think that you're trying to change anything with an English translation, um, the ESV, the English Standard Version. So John 19, I, I pick up a verse 31. The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath, or that Sabbath day was a high day, we explain all of that. That's a different type of Sabbath. We sought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. And we said the rationale for that is that they're going to die faster. They're going to suffocate quicker because they cannot put any weight then on their legs if they're broken and, and they will be just hanging down from their arms and putting stress on their lungs, can't breathe properly, and suffer, and they will die faster because it was the, 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 the Sabbath for join night, and that's the Passover Sabbath or holiday, and that's where they're going to break their legs. They request Pilate to do that, and they get permission to do that. Then came the soldiers and break the legs of the first and of the other which was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. That's what the King James Version said. Picture, picture, picture just three people on the cross, right? Picture just three people on the cross. In the light of what John is saying. So just came and break the leg, 
parts of the first and of the other. Now, if you if you have three persons on the cross, and you break the legs of the first, and you break the legs then of the other, who is the other? The other will be Jesus. For, for which side ever you come from, if you come from the left side or the right side, if you break the legs of the first and then of the other, the next person, the other is Jesus. First and then the other. If you come from the left, it's the first and then the other will be Jesus. If you come from the right, it's the first and then the other will be Jesus because he's in the middle. Now picture five, where you have two on either side, as John has indicated. Two on either side and Jesus in the middle. John says they break the leg of the first and then of the other who have been crucified with him. Remember, I said to you that the, the criminals or the malefactors were crucified with Jesus. They were closer to him. The robbers were crucified a little later and they were on the other side of, of these malefactors on the outside of, of, of Jesus. So the two closest to him were the criminals. So when John says that they break the leg of the other, of the first, and then the other who had been with him, you break the leg of the robber on the outside, on, on, on that side, whichever side you're coming from, and then you break the side, the leg of the other person who was closest to Jesus, the malefactor. If you come from the right side, it's the same thing. You break the leg of the first and then the second. The only way you could get a first and the second and then come to Jesus is if you have two persons on one side. That's, that's, the, that's the argument. And I'm saying that that is a, is a very solid point, which I think has some significant bearing here. If you were going to have three persons, you would have to skip one and break the leg of the other person on the other side and then come back to Jesus. And you wonder why you, you're going to be doing that. Where you're going to miss Jesus, and then you go over the other side. That, that's what would happen. It would have to happen if you were just dealing with three. So I am inclined to believe, in fact, that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all speaking of persons on the other side of Jesus, are all correct. There is no discrepancy here. When Matthew says there are two robbers, one on either side, he is right. When Mark says there are two robbers on either side, he is right. When Luke says there are two malefactors, one on either side, he is also right. And when John says that there are two on either side, he is also right. Matthew and Mark focus on the robbers. Luke focus on the criminals and or the malefactors. And John mentions both groups without calling or identifying the specific category. He made it clear that there were two on either side. And seeing what we read in, in, in our version, either side one, the word one was added by the, trans, by the translator. The only one of the, the translations that, that, we have looked, that I have looked at that did not mention that was the Young's literal translation, which, which tried to, to translate what the literal Greek had. And he did not use the word one. He used two on either side in his translation. Uh, Young's translation is, is called, it really refers to the Young's literal translation. But in the NIV, the KJV, and, um, and all of those other versions, you will see on either side one to give the impression that there was only one on either side. But John's original statement indicated that there were two on either side. So this is the scenario. They brought Jesus to Golgotha to crucify him. They put the two malefactors close to Jesus on the inside. They parted garments and all of that. And they crucified the robbers on the outside. And then they, sorry, they crucified the robbers on the outside. And then they, they sat down as Mark and John and Matthew indicated after the robbers were crucified, they sat down and, and looked at him and they cast lots for his garments, etc. 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 They they made reference to, to that. So what the the um the, the minority of of the interpret the, the translators would have indicated the minority 
is that they believe that the two criminals were crucified closer to Jesus, and then the robbers were crucified outside of Jesus. Both of the robbers joined with the crowd and mocked Jesus and basically called him a fraud. Both of them do indicate that one of the criminals, they, they would have been closest to the inside, and that's where they could communicate with each other and talk back to each other because they were on the inside of Jesus. The robbers were on the inside extremes, on the right and on the left. But it's these two malefactors who are talking, one of them that was joining with the others and saying, you see the Christ, where you don't have no fun cross and save us and yourself. And the other one recognized, and I believe that that was not just what he saw on the cross because Jesus did not really do anything significant on the cross. All Jesus did was to make um, comments like, Father, forgive me for knowing what we're doing. Um, my God, my God, what has all forsaken me? Um, into the hand to commit my spirit, etc., etc. Jesus made statements, and we often uh, have our traditions referring to the, the words, the last word of Jesus. Nothing significant. No. So you would ask yourself, what would have transpired to make one thief change his mind and repent so significantly after this we call Jesus a fraud? Now, if you read the, 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 um, the, the script, the narrative, and continue, you will see that. What Matthew mentioned, and he's the only one that mentioned it, about the earthquake and the tombstones cracking and the, and the, and the day of the temple being read. But Matthew is the only one that made reference to the, the event of the, of, the, of the earthquake. Yes, and that took place after all of that went on, 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 on the cross, the dialogue. So maybe if they had viewed some of these things and, and they had a change of mind, that, that took place afterwards. And I'm, I'm saying that from my understanding of analyzing the, the, the four narratives and putting them together, that is how I would be inclined. You don't have to agree with me. That is how you'd be inclined to, to believe that in truth and in fact, the minority of the commentators could be right in that there were two other persons on either side of Jesus as indicated by John. Now, I pause for any comments, any queries, any questions, or anything that I might have perhaps overlooked you think is significant to consider. Um, I, I, I break for you to, to do that. We can discuss them. And then I would want to, to entertain the question that was asked at the end of the last session. Somebody said they had something in relation to the resurrection which we want to entertain because we would move on then to start looking at the narrative in connection to the resurrection and what questions are raised from the narrative. But let us try to resolve this quickly. I remember we're, we're doing the same thing. I'm going to be finishing all of my conversation, but it's important to give you a chance to ask questions. If you have them for the next 15 minutes, that's why we close at nine o'clock and we do not go um, deep after nine. Okay, so, my, my pause at this point for you to examine my analysis of, of the accounts and the narrative they're given. Uh, good evening, Reverend Chapman. Yes, Brother Spooner. Yes, good evening. I, um, I've read the four, um, the four Gospels accounts. Yes. I, yeah, I tend to um, agree with you that from my reading and understanding of it, that there were more than two. Okay. Um, St. John, in John Gospel, he said that the, um, in John 19, 17, and 18, mm -hmm. he said, especially in 18, he said when they were crucified, when they crucified him, and two others with him on either side, one yes. and Jesus in the midst. Mm -hmm. King James Version, mm -hmm. Jesus in the midst. Yeah. Now, if you have only two, he cannot be in the midst of two. He will be in the middle, the correct um the that would be a, a grammatical error. So John will have to be speaking of more than two. 
Okay. All right. I see what you're looking at. Missed a uh, middle. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. He would you no know, if if there were only two, um, if there were only two, he would have used the word between. Mm -hmm. This would be correct English. Okay. But he he said um in the midst. So that, that yeah. tells me that there were more than two. All because right. you, can, you can't be in the midst of only two. And, and but not, not but not only that, um Luke. Look in his um in his account, mm -hmm. he said um, there were also two other comers. When you come when you come to that, you see when you read in these things, you have to be very careful and just don't read and go along. Yes, <laughs> very very much so by the um, Luke said um and there were also two other. Comer. No, when, why did he put that in there? Or, I mean, he could have uh, said, and there were also two manufacturers. Yeah. If you follow what I'm saying. If, yeah, I follow, I follow, other people could argue that, you know, it might not necessarily mean two others. He could be just saying that there were two others side of one one person or I just said a one person he combined them as two hmm. that's how some people can say but I, I see the point that you're making as you say you have to look at the, the, the very fine details and, and as I said very often we, we don't read the Bible with, with that sometimes intensity and detailed scrutiny and that's where we miss things so that's why I'm saying that I hope that during this session it opens up our eyes to what we can miss if we do not take the time to be meticulous about details, God is very meticulous about things and, and he's very precise about things that he gives us in the word and that he wants us to see. And we should try to make sure that we do not miss them because we, we glance over them because in our minds, it's stuck a tradition and we miss them. Yeah, and then every word, every word in the Bible I mean, it is important. The words and the punctuation, they're not just oh, there. Yes. Oh, yes. They could be there. <laughs> so these are things that we have to look at and very careful when you're reading them. And don't miss them because you can easily miss things and just go on and read. Right. So and what, 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 look, what is your after what you're saying? That. Yeah, and what I should add in relation to what you're saying, I, I, I mentioned it the last thing, but I did not um, I thought to, to identify. There's, there's a little mark that you see something at the beginning of a paragraph. It looks like a, like a quaver in music. It's a little black dot with two lines. Now, a lot of people don't pay attention to that, you know, but that is very significant. It's called a, a, a pivot point. I think that's what the, 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 the name of it is. But what, what that indicates is that there's a change of paragraph or a change of thought. And it is not normally a progression or a sequence from the verses above, because sometimes we read the scripture and we come down, but if every verse that follows is a direct um, sequence or, or chron chronological order from the verse that I've gone above, but that mark indicates that there's a change of thought or an introduction of, of, a, of, a, of, a, of an idea that is not directly connected to the verse that went above it. And you've got to pay attention to even that because it can give you some significant understanding that can make a, a tremendous difference in how you read and interpret a particular text. So, so you're right, every comma. I remember, as I said, in the original, there were no paragraphs, there were no commas, there were no punctuation mark in the original text. There was, there was just the Greek written down. And so translators have to come and add the, the punctuation. So that, that's why we have to be careful sometimes of punctuation that is even shown because a comma or a full stop can change the meaning of a, of a, of a, of a sentence. See? And we have to be careful how we read things. And also, as I said, sometimes the, the, um, the translators are italicized words let you know they have added a word, but they do not often, they do not always italicize the word. As I show you in John, I don't think the word one was italicized, but they added that word. In, in, the, in the text, but 
John was specific that there were two on either side. Thank you, Brother Spooner, for okay. your contribution. Okay, thank you. Very important. Yeah, uh, Rev. Yes, sir. Um, Sandra Pollard Bostic, I believe she has either a question or a comment. Yeah? Yes. Yes, Sandra. Sandra Pollard. Hey, good night. Can you hear me? Good night. <clears throat> okay. Um, truthfully, Eddie, in the beginning, I was, because I read them and I read them and I read them, and I was still only seeing the two on either side oh. of Jesus. Yes. And even though you were explaining about the different translations of the word used for thief and for criminal, mm -hmm. I really still was not buying it. <laughs> All right. Because quite frankly, my whole life, I've always believed that it was Jesus in the middle and one on either side. Yes. But <laughs> when you make the reference, though, to um, verse 32, where it says that the soldiers therefore came and brought the legs of the first man who had been crucified yes. with Jesus, right. and then those of the other. But when they came yes. to Jesus, he was Jesus. already dead, did not break his leg. So, yes. I mean, okay, if you think about it, if it's Jesus in the middle and just one on either side, as you pointed out, why would they move from the one man that was on one side past Jesus and go over to the other side and break the other man's right. leg? Right. Unless they that just really, that. Truly, unless they wanted to leave Jesus for last, <sighs> don't know. But it wouldn't make sense to skip and go over to the other side. So it would have to be you would move in a and and I mean I don't know what would have been the proximity of each of the crosses to one another. I mean close enough that I guess you could have had some sort of conversations, but it wouldn't make sense to move from one side and go over to the other side. So it was only when you got to that verse there then that. I would say that I would have to consider that it was more than two others and possibly four. Right, and Sandra, and don't don't forget John. Don't forget John. The original translation, John said there were two on either side. He he he, he made that specific point. So so even if we can buy it, we can buy it from the rest. John John clarified it in case other people and a lot of people are aware you were. I was there too, Sandra. In, in, in reading the text just at the surface level. I was also there. I, I, I saw it that way. As they said, when you, when you give more intense study to the, to the and, and John tries very much, very hard to eliminate any uncertainty by trying to add information. And I show you that in, in other areas already that the others might have missed because he wants the truth to come out. And he precisely said there were two others on either side. That's the clear right. original text. So we, okay. we have to recognize that the word of God does not contradict itself. And it does not. So what we mean then is that Mark and, and, and Matthew spoke about the robbers. Luke and John spoke about the other two. John didn't specifically mention criminals or robbers, but he did indicate that there were two on either side of and Jesus in the midst. So he's saying that there were four people there with Jesus. And we've got to go if the word doesn't contradict itself. So we have to <laughs> mean that the other two have to tie in with John. They have to. I, I, I guess so. But then also, too, and John does not, and John, there's no mention of the robbers, thieves, or whoever is um, insulting no, Jesus. No, like he, doesn't. no he, doesn't. he doesn't. He doesn't. He doesn't. He doesn't identify. You see, and that's what happens in any narrative. When people go on a scene to report, Anything that they witness, people are going to, to, to focus on different things, different people, different events, different occurrences. You listen to stories told by people that you see, and that's what happens. And that's all happens that any narratives that we have here in the Gospels, they each focus on different details. They take in consideration the audience they're writing to, what things mean to people. And you're going to get those four different reports that are independent, which is important. But when you bring them together, you get the truth. And John makes sure that you come to that saying that he was the last of the writers and he tries to make sure he fills in any little gaps that could lead people down a different path. They believe that, that John account is the summation of the reality. So then the other issue then comes in, I mean, without having the original text, then right. it also I guess, depends too on the, the version of the Bible that you have in terms of like, for example, 
I do prefer the NIV because I find it an easier read to the King James Version. But yes. sometimes, you know, the, the when you do compare the two, the King James Version and NIV, you will see that the choice of words are different. Are different. Are different. And, and, and that they also create some some ish some problems for us when we're reading it because yes you know that's you what take people say to you. right that's why people say Sandra when even when you read other translation always go back to King James because the King James yeah. is the closest of the text to the original and if you were to do a study of, of versions you will realize that if, as I said translators also superimpose their particular views and some of these translators you'll be you'll be amazed to see that translated the, the NIV um, have certain belief systems that could be questioned. Like, like um, the, the, the individuals who, who were prominent in, in the transition of the NIV. So that's why you have to be careful um, when you're reading translations that you make sure you still go back. That's Scott and Hart were two persons who translated the NIV. They were major persons. And if you read about that Scott and Hart, you would see some of their belief systems would contradict some of the views we have. Christians, so you know, but they're but they're they're educators, they're they're theologians, and, and they're knowledgeable in certain things, but they have their own philosophical positions too. See, so those are things that you have to be careful of. All right, but thank Great. you for your contribution. Thanks. Yes. All right, if there are no more comments or interjections, I, I hope that you know you, you go go and think it through, read it through, and analyze what I have said. As I say, I like I like to see details and, and I am prepared to adjust my view if the person gives me evidence that is convincing and that is biblical. And that's why I said I, I don't like a comment that these Christians, you know, whatever you bring to them, they're gonna hold on to tradition. See, and that is what I'm afraid of that some people think. I'm, I'm saying we have to be prepared to adjust our views and our understanding. If truth comes to us that has a biblical base, not an opinion, a biblical base, and that's what I try to do. I, I listen to what people are saying, I examine it with the, with the idea and the intensity. Now, I want to entertain the question of the person is online now that had a question on the, the resurrection account, which we will look at. If that person has that question, I could entertain that or what I could do is, is read um, some of the things I have noticed that people have queried, they have questioned in relation to the account because you, you have things in the crucifixion narrative, the resurrection narrative that also appear to have discrepancies or contradictions, which again, when you pull the story together, you will see that it's really interesting when you pull it together. It's like an investigator and analyzing data and information and pulling it together and getting the narrative correct. It is a beautiful thing when you discover that from the world and see that it does not contradict itself, and it's not errant. I believe that the word doesn't have errors. I believe that errors are created by us in terms of our transition, in terms of our interpretation, and that is really how we come. The word of God itself is in error. It, it is all truth, and I just think we have to see it, so then you miss it. So, Sanjo, was it you that had the question on the um, the resurrection? Yeah, it, it was. Um, All right. Well, let me hear your question now and, and add it to the rest that we have if it's not one of those. Okay, because there, there were quite a few, though. I'll try and go through them as quickly as I can. Um, <laughs> yes. But um, we will list them. We're not hard <laughs> to but we will list them. Okay. So, mm -hmm. we had in... Um, which one was this? Was this Mark? I had to... There were some that came out of Matthew, just flipping over the pages. Mm -hmm. right. Matthew. Um, right, so I had one thing about the, the holy people who were raised to life and came out of the tombs, etc. But it said that yes. they appeared well after Jesus' resurrection. resurrection. So yeah. if, if they came and, out... And Matthew, and Matthew is the only one that records that. That only ones that recorded it. So if they came out of the tombs on the day that he was crucified, but then they only appeared to the people after his resurrection, which is three days later. So I was just wondering where were they for those three days? And like you said, Jesus was in the tomb. 
And then I had other things like, um, they, I mean, everybody seems to be named Mary. So I wasn't quite sure sometimes which of the Marys it was that was by the foot of the cross or that went back to the tomb. Yes. All right. Um, that, that, that's an important concern. Yes. And, and then there was, and this is in the account of, in Luke's account, Remember, he, Luke has in this section about um, the two on the road to, is it? The Emmaus. Emmaus. The Emmaus. Emmaus. Yes. Mm -hmm. So they're going the to Emmaus and they met up with Jesus, who in the beginning they didn't realize it was Jesus, et cetera, et cetera. But yes. it was suggesting that it took them, I mean, it said that Emmaus is seven miles from Jerusalem and they went right. there and it took them like the whole day to get there because then when they got there and they asked Jesus to stay, they said it was getting dark. But yet, uh -huh. then when they realized that it was Jesus, then it said that they got him and returned to Jerusalem at once. And I'm just wondering how they got back to Jerusalem. That seven mile trek one way, they seemed to return to Jerusalem rather quickly. And it said that, that yeah. they found the eleven and those with them. And and so I I don't I don't understand how they got back from that seven mile trip back to Jerusalem all within the same day, even though it was dark when they got there it was getting dark when they got there so there were just there were just things like that that i couldn't fully um right, fully comprehend yeah, yeah and then and then there's the accounts where you know the women were told to go and 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 tell the brothers that you know the lord had, had risen and yet in one of the accounts it said that they didn't tell anybody anything because they were afraid and then in the other accounts, it seemed as if they did tell them. And so it's just different little things like that, that I'm, yes, I yes, guess, missing, exactly. missing certain things. And then in one account, it seems as if Joseph, the guy that put all the, the stone in front of the tomb, in one account, it seems to suggest that he did it himself, but then he had somebody else with him. And then the angel that there's only one account that speaks about the angel coming and rolling the red stone. And then another one account, there's like only mention of one angel, and then another account is mention of two angels. So um there appears to be an awful lot of discrepancies around the resurrection. You know what I said? Yes. Appears appears, right? Yeah. Appears. So can, you are right. Start I, I, those. Yes. Yeah. I was saying to Jeff earlier that we might do one more and then do this first application in the final session. But from what you are indicating tonight, uh, we didn't get a chance really to start in any detail. We might, we, might, we might have to do two nights dealing with the resurrection because you rightfully say there is more to connect around the resurrection and more things that raises questions in your head than, than even with the crucifixion. That's where you need to, to go through in detail and fine tune. But all your concerns are important concerns. Now, remember, I said what is significant in, in, in interpreting the Bible and doing your, your, your hermeneutics or exegesis is that you have to look for what the Bible says and what it does not say. When we don't have something specifically said by the Bible, we add our interpretation on it. It could be correct or it could be incorrect. There's nothing wrong with trying to extrapolate and trying to put things together, even though the specific detail may not have been mentioned in the Bible. Because we have just been doing that with, with, um, with our analysis of what happened at the cross. We've been trying to put things together that have been specifically said, but the reference indicates or the inference indicates such that you can go with it. So there are occasions like those. Now, Matthew uh, Reverend is Jackman, going to go on. Just, yes, yes. Just, just for um, Sister Sandra's information, there are mm -hmm. six, six different Marys recorded in the New Testament. Okay, I was going to, I was going to come to that when, when we get that point. And I mentioned that, I mentioned that before. There are a number of Marys, and, and Simon was another common name in that in that period of time, and that's why it's nice to get confused with the Marys and, and Simon and, and other names that are, are, are common. But yeah, Mary was a very common name. We see reference made to it, but we will explain when we look at the details which Mary is being referenced um, in the account. And that's why some nice people get confused with this um, interpreting the scripture because we need to be 
clear um, which character we are dealing with. Because if we don't get that right, it can cause a misinterpretation. What I was saying to Sandra on, on the Matthew account with the rest with the earthquake and, and um, other things, there's some people saying that that would have been just symbolic to indicate the power of Jesus' death and resurrection and what it entails, and it might not have literally happened. But they did mention to you that there was a, a historian called Talus that wrote about that earthquake in 52 AD. And the first gospel, which most commentators believe was Mark, was written close to AD 70. So which means that he was not copying anything from Mark or any of the other um, um, narratives that were written by, 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 by these, these um, New Testament writers. He was, he was basing that on, on source evidence that he would have gotten. So he was not copying something, which is important. And then he've also been doing some research and realized that people who study earthquakes and the geology of the past indicates that there was a series of earthquakes between AD 30 and AD 33. Those are the years that people are trying to, to, um, to work out as to which one Jesus was in crucified. We're not, we're not going to try to deal with that because that is not significant for our dialogue. Some people say, AD 30, some people say 80, 33, but that's not what we're, we're trying to emphasize. We're dealing with the details. And, and this says that, yes, there's a possibility that there were earthquakes around the time of Jesus' crucifixion. So that's testified by geology, it's testified by a source account. And therefore, I believe Matthew is speaking of something that really happened. There was an earthquake, tombs were open, and the, and the graves were opened up, and the Bible says, that people came for, and they were actually seen. They were seen. So I don't believe it's any um, theoretical thing. They were seen by people in Jerusalem now. So I ask a good question. Where were they between the time of, of, of the crucifixion and when they were resurrected when Jesus came forth? The Bible does not say. The Bible does not say either um, where Jesus was when he was crucified and then after his resurrection. We have an indication that he said to the thief, today you shall be with me, not the thief, the malefactor or the criminal, the day you shall be with me. See, my family says saying the thief because that's what is registered in my head. The, the, the malefactor, the day you shall be with me in paradise. And he was with him in paradise. Some people think that it meant heaven. No, it's not heaven because Jesus did not go to heaven when he was crucified and then come back to earth. Because remember, he told Mary, do not touch me for I have not yet ascended it to my father. And if he said that on the resurrection morning, then it meant that he could not have told the thief that you're going to be with me in heaven today because he had not yet ascended to the Father when he spoke to Mary. So we have to, we have to notice that carefully. Paradise is where the souls of the departed are held when you die. And if we read Luke 16 with David and Lazarus, they died and they went to the grave. They were in two different compartments. One was in a place of torment. One was a place called Abraham bosom. Sometimes people refer to that as paradise. And there was a great gulf fix between them. Nobody knows precisely where paradise is. There's a debate about where it is, but it's located in the earth, on the earth, or somewhere um, in, 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 the, in, the, um, in the space realm, in the realm of space, but it is not, it is not heaven. It's, it's a holding place. So Jesus was right. When he told the thief, today you shall be with me in paradise. But that's where he was. We said in the, in the um, statements that we often repeat, he descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the grave, from the dead. Hell meaning Hades. Where is that? And we talk about Jesus went and took the keys of death and hell from Satan. Where did he go to take those keys? And we're not talking literal keys. We're talking about authority. All those are things that we have to debate and discuss. But yes, Sandra. Your concerns are noted. As I said, we will stop at nine o'clock. They are noted and they will be discussed in our um, dialogue in relation to the, to the resurrection. What I'm going to assure you that a lot of things that seem to be complications and which seem to be contradictions are going to be clarified. And you're going to see one beautiful narr narrative which explains each of those events. How many women went to the tomb? That's a question. In some you read two, in some you see three, and John only focused on Mary Magdalene. And you would think that Mary Magdalene was the only one who went to the cross. When you went to the tomb, when you look at the narrative, you will see she went there with other women. I put this in your head. 
and there, there were not just three women. Luke says there were the three that prepared the spices with others. With others. With others mean it can't be one person. It has to be at least two, because you use the plural, which means that you have three plus a possible two others, which will make it five. Five women could have gone to the tomb. They went there, and they saw that the stone was rolled away, and they didn't enter. They moved immediately from there. And Mary head out and to call Peter and John, where the other women went to carry the news to the, 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 the other disciples. Where were they? We discussed all of that. Then Mary came back running with Peter and John, who were headed there. They looked in the tomb and they bolted. They saw that the, the, the grapplings were there and excitement and adrenaline kicking in them. Mary decided she would stay behind. So the angels did not speak to Mary on her first time at the tomb, when she remained in and she looked in and saw the angels. And then she began to speak to them and when she looked around, she saw Jesus. So when, when um, one account says she appeared first to Mary, people say, well, how can we pair first, first to Mary and there were other women at, at, the, at the tomb? Mary was alone then when Jesus saw her and she was the first person to see him. He met the other women then on the way back. And, 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 and then they saw him. So you see, the accounts can be reconciled. But remember, you always look at the timing, very critical. The details and the emphasis of the persons. There was a reason why Luke, why John was emphasizing Mary Magdalene. He had a reason for that. And when we read the narratives, as I say, we will see how they all reconciled. For all the disciples, the same place. Were Peter and John the same place as the other disciples that these women were going to tell? We have to study the scriptures, folks, and analyze the details and see how we piece the narrative together. And then it makes beautiful sense. It, it has tremendous cohesion, and we see there are no discrepancies. I have thrown these things out to you to add in a little piece to show you how we can start to reconcile things. But I'm going to leave a lot of the excitement for the next session. That is to, that's to tickle your interest. I said, ah, I know we're beginning to see things that make sense. And when Jesus told Mary not to touch him, he is not a saint. And then he allowed Thomas to touch him. I said, put your hand in my side. What's the difference? Why did he tell Mary don't? And now he allowed Thomas to do it. When did he see Thomas? When did he meet the people on MS Road? What events took place? on the resurrection day. All the visits that Jesus made were not on the resurrection day. Remember, Jesus remained 40 days on the earth before his ascension. And he made a number of appearances to his disciples on different times, in different places, did different things, and all of that fits in the narrative. And watch that number 40 again, for very significant. Remember I told you that in God's timeline, 40 is a very significant number number of, of maturity and, and completeness. So those are some things folks will be looking into in our next session. All right, it's going to be a beautiful session. Don't miss it, because I believe you'll get a number of your questions answered and get some of, of your uh, misunderstandings or, or apart discrepancies or contradictions clarified. Right, but it was good sharing with you tonight. I remember go home and read those accounts again and see if you can come to the position that I've come to that there were not just three people, two people on the cross of Jesus. There they were indeed four. And the Bible um account will confirm that when we analyze all the details. So thank you very much for being in on the session. And God bless you until we meet the next occasion. Don't miss it because there's a lot that has to be carried. Through resurrection account because it's very very critical and that's why I'm saying the details are important because these details are all connected to God's plan and, and God's order and while we focus on the event we've got to get the details right so that people then cannot say that the Bible has contradictions and it is not accurate and, and one person said the Bible is like a, a faithful husband he makes up all the details and you never get the story right. So you can't believe it. You can't trust him. That's what a comment.
clearly said about the Bible. Mark Paul Smith in 1995. But no, the Bible is a faithful husband. Because sometimes the details that you get about the husband are circumstantial, details that are not correct. And when you examine them, the husband proved to be faithful and the people who misunderstood and misrepresent the facts. So I am saying that the Bible is a faithful husband and not unfaithful. You trust it. Amen to that. And good night to you all. And back over to Jeff.